Welcome everyone again. Today we are going to deal with a difficult topic, a topic that sends goosebumps in every parent's body when they just think that soon their little child is going to ask them the famous question, can I have the phone? Can I have my own computer? What are we going to tell him? A truly terrifying answer to a, a question. And uh, most fights that happen between parents and uh, children, unfortunately nowadays, involve some kind of technological device whether it is television, whether it is phone, computer, video game, some kind of gadget with parents appropriate the child and uh, the child thinking that that's his key to happiness, his key to experience, everyone has it. I also want everyone is in everyone is talking about the the show or the movie they saw and I'm left behind with nothing to comment it's very difficult for children and it's very difficult and painful to see for the parents to see how their children are getting sucked into addicted hurt and they feel powerless what can they do they're scared of their children, and they're scared for their children. So first, let me say a few words about entertainment in general. Once I had a conversation with a relative of mine who asked if we plan to have a television for our children, and we answered no. Our children are not going to watch TV and they're not going to watch movies. So she was appalled. She was very surprised and she was even angry. She said, why you don't want your children to live in the real world? And I thought about it and I asked her, do you think that television and movies is what's going to teach my children about the real world? I would say the opposite. By showing your children the television and movies, you're not letting them live in a real world. And uh, that, this is what our sages say, that we have to protect our mind. We have to protect our eyes in order to protect our mind. Our mind is a gift, a tool that God gave us. We say that God gave us the Torah, the written Torah and the oral Torah. And God gave us a tool to understand and analyze the Torah. And that is our mind. And God gave us the gift of logic. And if we keep our mind clean, pure, we will be able to read the Torah, listen to Torah, and understand it properly and apply it properly, extrapolate it properly, and live our life properly. But imagine, if we take our most precious tool, our mind, and we make it crooked, we fill it with wrong ideas, we teach it and train our mind that the world works differently than it really is. And then when we learn the Torah, we will understand it through that lens, through that crooked way. And then when we try to apply the teachings of the Torah to our life, we are going to misapply it. We're going to uh, see everything in a crooked way. And then you're going to see, uh, you're going to have people who 
behave in a way that is not consistent with the Torah. And you ask, they're going to say, well, I'm doing everything. This is what I think is proper. Such people will learn Talmud and they will have difficulty understanding the flow of the Gemara. They will read and their mind is not going to take them where it's supposed to. And they will suffer and they will think, what's going on? Why my friends are understanding and all my team, my explanations are wrong. What's with my head? Am I stupid? What's going on that I sit in class and I don't understand what the Rebbe is talking about? He says, if this, then this, and I don't see the connection. Why is it? And that's because when we expose ourselves to television, movies, and the media, which shows us relationships between people which are made up, which are not real, which are invented, imagined, artificial, we train our mind to think of those lines. He says, think and if he says this, she gets upset. And when she gets upset, he behaves like this. And we think this is the proper way of behaving because we see it on TV. Because in our favorite, that's how the characters behave. And then when we are faced with the same situation at home, when our spouse is going to behave a certain way, we're going to say, oh, I remember in the movie the main character behaved like this towards his spouse when she behaved like that. Must be, that's the proper way, and I'm going to behave the same way. We start analyzing and, and uh, <clears throat> thinking that real life has to go according to the script that we witnessed in the movie or in the video. And even worse in the video game that we're going to speak about. So we have to realize it and uh, understand that in addition to entertainment, we're also educating our children. But not the kind of education that the previous generation, previous generations um, thought. I remember my great-grandmother in 1985, 1986, up to 1989, when they left to Israel, in Tashkent, so they had black and white TV from decades before that. And she said, you know what? Really, she was 85 years old at that time. She said, you know, really, TV is not good but I'm keeping it here and I'm watching it every day for a few minutes a day for the news. I want to know the news. And uh, at that time, in 1985 till 1990, watching news was not so dangerous. It was relatively safe. The worst that you could see on the news back then in Russia was that you might hear some communist agenda. But what else did they show on the news? They would tell you how much this farm collected potatoes and that there is a record snowstorm in Siberia and that the, the harvest of apples is especially good this year and that a certain factory produced a record number of uh, machines this month. That's the kind of news you would hear in Russia. It was encouraging kind of news that our country is, is uh, doing well, 
this city is prospering, this industry is doing, is doing great. It was a pleasure watching news in Russia. Only good news. It was as if they studied the Hafez Chaim laws of Lashon Hara. There was no Lashon Hara there. It was only good news on TV, on the radio. I remember it was a pleasure to, to listen to the news, watch the news on TV. Now, you compare this to us. Is it inspirational to watch even the news? You turn on any news channel. Will you be uplifted after the 10 minutes of uh, news update? Will you have greater desire to live in this world? Will you learn something positive about the world? Most likely, 99 out of 100 pieces of news in the United States are negative or detrimental to your psychology, and especially children's psychology. So television is no longer safe, no longer harmless, especially for sensitive children, and some children are sensitive. I remember when my children, you know, they are relatively isolated. When my children heard the news of riots, they heard the news of some terrorist acts, they were truly traumatized and they, they had nightmares. And this is not only with my children. So many children find it very difficult to manage when they hear constantly bad, bad, everything bad, such crime, theft, robbery, murder, rape, terrorist acts, hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunami. How much can a child handle? After a while, they develop fear towards the world. They, they, they even call it mean world syndrome, where children think that the world is bad, that the world is out to get them that the world is a dangerous place. And they become fearful. They have low self-esteem. And they suspect every person they meet. He might be a crook. He is out to hurt me. He is out to cheat me. He's probably looking at me because he wants to rape me. Everyone becomes their enemy. And it's true. You have to be careful. It's true. You have to ha be cautious. But out of a hundred people that you, you're going to meet on the street or in your life, your friends, neighbors, co-workers, how many of them are really dangerous? Maybe, maybe 1%. How many uh, predators are there in your neighborhood, do you think, out of all the houses? Or on the daily bus on the sub or the subway that you take? I wouldn't think more than 1%. But the way that television, movies, the news portrays it is that the world is a dangerous place. I'm not safe anywhere. So now we want to, we want to improve the quality of life of our child. And really we are scarring them for life. We are making them fearful always on guard, stressed. Guys, shower. And they cannot enjoy even simple, simple um, activities. Imagine, they're, they're taking 
a hike, a nature hike, and they're scared that somebody is going to jump on them and kill them, rob them, or rape them. What kind of life is that? They're laying there on the, on the, on the sand, under the sun, and they're scared for their life, their possessions, constantly in fear. They heard so many robberies that they check the house if it's locked, and the car if it's locked. Do they have possessions? Should I not carry cash? How many, how many times do you think you're going to be robbed in your lifetime? Most people, I'm assuming, don't get robbed in their lifetime. Most houses, majority of houses, don't get robbed in the lifetime of the owner. So you have to be careful, but you should not be obsessed with it. And that's, that's why this generation is seeing so much obsessive behavior. OCD is constantly on the rise. Why? Because we're constantly threatening our children. Be careful, and now it's even more than ever. Wear the mask or you will die. It's scary to breathe even. First, they poison our water. It's, it's dangerous to drink the, the water from the sink. Now they're poisoning our air. It's dangerous to breathe. If you go outside without a mask, it's dangerous. Is it really dangerous? It's not. Is the water really dangerous? It's not. Are the streets really dangerous the way they're trying to portray? Will you get shot? Most likely not, unless you're dealing with drugs or you're carrying a gun yourself. Most likely you will have peaceful, long life. So why get scared? Especially for us, the Jews, we know Hashem is with us. We should not be fearful. And imagine, chas v'shalom, that somebody will cheat you. And somebody will take advantage of you. It may happen once in 10 years. So is it worth it to be constantly on guard for your entire lifetime, just because once in a while someone will take advantage of you. So what? Sometimes they'll steal uh, $5, sometimes they'll steal $100, sometimes they'll cheat you on $1,000. But your quality of life is much more valuable. Your peace of mind, the most important possession you have, and that what determines the quality of life, your peace of mind is worth much more than the phone that might be stolen, some jewelry, some money that will be stolen, or somebody will overcharge you. To have peace of mind is more valuable. And so we should keep that in mind. And if we want to give confidence to our children, if we want to give them pleasant, enjoyable life, life where they don't have to constantly look over their shoulder and make sure nobody is following them and be scared to go into a, an elevator with a neighbor, be scared to breathe and drink and eat because maybe somebody is poisoning them. If we want them to enjoy life, we should remove the negativity from them. What is the greatest source of negativity? Unfortunately, it is the technology. It is the media. It is the internet, radio, and television. So, entertainment comes with a price. And the first price is that it makes our mind crooked. It teaches us artificial logic, which does not work in real life. Number two, the, the, the damage that entertainment provides is, or causes is, loss of peace of mind, fear, and the panic that it causes people to have. OCD that people develop just by watching the news. 
and general lack of happiness because constantly they're being shown accidents, robbings, murders, rapes, terrorist acts, famines and wars. And somebody might say, and people have asked me many times, but Rabbi, if you keep your children isolated, they're not going to know what's going on in the world. So now let's just take a look at the statistics. This statistics I took from this book. It's called The Parenting Path by Dr. David Palkowitz. And he gives these um, terrible statistics. By the time average American children have finished elementary school, elementary school, when parents are uh, watching them, making sure that they want the age of shows, have witnessed 8,000 murders on the television. 8,000 murders, imagine. 8,000 people being killed in front of you. It's like you're witnessing the destruction of Beit HaMikdash and 8,000 Jews are being slaughtered in front of you, being shot, being killed. 8,000 murders on average. Elementary school child watches until he graduates elementary school. And again, this is with parents, supervision, with uh, trying to protect them from inappropriate contact, con content. 8,000 murders. An elementary child on average sees until he graduates eighth grade. And we're not even talking about how many robberies, how many rapes, how many violent acts. And by the end of high school, the typical adolescent has seen 200,000 acts of violence. And we're not even mentioning forbidden relations. 200,000 acts of violence are witnessed by a high school student. Now, for those who ask these questions, but Rabbi, if you isolate your children, if you protect them too much, they're not going to know what's going on in the world. Imagine, if by the end they finish high school, if instead of watching 200,000 violent acts, imagine that my children who are isolated, we don't have TV, we don't have open internet, my children don't have smartphones, and the uh, access to computer. They don't watch videos regularly. So imagine if instead of watching 200,000 violent acts in their high school years, imagine that by the time they finish high school, they will only watch let's say 100 violent acts. Accidentally, they're going to visit the grandmother, they're going to be in a store that has a TV, maybe they'll hear it from classmates, maybe, maybe they'll, they'll uh, be in the airport or wherever it is. Imagine that by the time they're 18 years old, they're going to witness 100 acts of violence. Isn't that enough? 100 times in their lifetime they witnessed robbery, murder, rape, abuse. 100 times in just 18 years. Wouldn't that be enough to know that the world is a dangerous place? Why do I need to watch 200,000 acts of violence just to be exposed to the, the real world and to know that the world is dangerous? In my real life, Will I see 200,000 acts of violence? Unless you are 
a Roman soldier who is uh, slaughtering and plundering, or you are a Nazi soldier working in a concentration camp, never in your life you're going to see 100,000 violent acts in your lifetime. So why do our children need to see 200,000 violent acts in just their high school years? Don't worry. As much as you try to protect your children from technology, from internet, from TV, from exposure to the media, they will see enough and they will hear enough. So don't worry that y your children will, will be um, in a bubble, that they're going to be as if they're from a different planet. Not to worry. For example, about once in every two or three months, we take our children to visit their grandmother in Queens. We live in Muncie. And on that trip that lasts only an hour there, an hour back, and just a few minutes walking on the streets of Queens and in the building, they see enough. They see drug addicts, they see homeless, and they pay attention. They see how people dress on the street, almost like dogs that they're walking. They see excrement on the floor. They see people screaming and yelling at each other and cursing. So just once in three months, what our children see is enough to, to tell them what the real world is. We don't have to live in it and we don't have to watch it constantly. But at least somebody who is living in Queens, somebody who is living in an environment where all this is a reality, constantly, every day, why do we need to expose our children to more filth, more dirt? Now, the, the third effect of entertainment and news and educational um, content on the internet and, and television is <clears throat> once they made a study, this was done in the uh, former Soviet Union in 1930s. They took a cat and they attached electrodes to the cat's brain. They cut the brain open, they figured out uh, where to attach it by if the cat enjoys it, they electrical signal into its brain, it doesn't like it, they attached the electrode and they gave uh, the cat a small dose of electricity to stimulate those parts of the brain that give it pleasure. They attached it to a battery and they put a button, a large button that's easy to press. And they taught the cat to, with its paw, to press the button. And they observed. And they saw that the cat is enjoying itself. It's pressing the button. It receives the electric signal into the brain. It feels good. It presses the button again. Another dose of free pleasure. And the cat continued doing it and enjoying. They put food in the cage. They put milk in the cage. And they notice that the cat is not drinking. The cat is not eating. They put a female cat into the cage. And the cat did not pay attention to the female. And eventually that cat died from starvation and from lack of sleep. 
the cat does not have a brain like us. You might say, how can the cat be, become addicted? But that's what happened to the cat. It continued pressing the bottom until it died from starvation, lack of water, and lack of sleep. Because if you have free pleasure, why do you need to eat? Why do you need to work? Why do you need to do anything with your life if I can receive free pleasure? And that's the danger of entertainment. That's the danger of television, internet, computer games, video games, anything that stimulates the child without the child having to work is detrimental to, to him because it's taking him away from life. It's taking him away from reality. Another statistics that uh, Jonas van Rosenblum brings in, 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 in uh, his article titled Have Smartphones Destroyed an Entire Generation? He says that 12th graders today spend less time together with friends than 8th graders a decade ago. Which means at a time when a child usually goes out to spend more time socially because parents allow them to. You wouldn't allow your eighth grader to spend nights out with his friends, but your 12th, 12th grader, hopefully you will allow more freedom and you will encourage them, yes, meet friends, spend more time with friends. And they found that High school students don't care for each other. They don't need friends anymore. As one, one student said, we like our phones more than we like actual people. This is a quote from a, from a high school student. If you can get free pleasure you're not going to achieve anything in life. And unfortunately, I have parents calling me saying, my, my son, my daughter, they're just sitting watching TV. They're on their internet the whole day. They're not going to work. They don't care to do well in college. They don't have friends. They don't date. Why? Because I can get free pleasure. Free pleasure is better than pleasure that I have to pay for, that I have to work hard for. If I have to take a risk to speak to somebody who might reject me, if I have to, if I have to control my character to, to be able to interact with somebody who might have different views, if I have to buy my date lunch or supper, why do I need it? I can just turn on the TV and I'm going to have a date and I'm, I'm going to have pleasure for free. So that's another danger of entertainment that we would like to provide our children and let them enjoy that in the end it will literally kill them. Just like drugs kill, just like alcohol kills, so too free entertainment kills. It, diminish, it diminishes accomplishment. It diminishes their drive, their pursuit of happiness, pursuit of, of knowledge. They're satisfied to spend the rest of their life in front of the screen. Because really, it is very exciting. It is hormone uh, raising what else do you need you can see everything you can hear everything learn about everything be excited you, I don't even have to go mountain climbing anymore I don't even have to go on a roller coaster anymore 
I don't have to go swimming anymore because the experience that's provided by the screen is almost identical. So that's the third thing we have to be aware that the, the, the child who experiences entertainment might get so addicted that they will not have interest in life anymore. And of course, the, the, the greatest danger of um, exposure to technology, media, and entertainment is the forbidden content. The forbidden content, we all know what it is. The, in addition to violence, murder, the forbidden content is forbidden relations. Images, videos, sites that are not appropriate even for adults. Nobody should ever be found on these sites. I often think our sages say that you should imagine that today is your last day. And imagine, chas v'shalom, a person reaches the end of his life and it happens to be that he is on the internet. And uh, he doesn't have a chance to erase his history. He doesn't have a chance to leave the site. He just drops dead. And his uh, relatives come in, and the doctors come in, and the police comes in, and his rabbi comes in. And what do they see? They see him in front of a screen with inappropriate images on it. What a shame, what an embarrassment is going to be for him forever. That's how he died. That was his last moment on this earth. But every moment that we are alive is just the same. Every moment that Hashem sees us and we ourselves, our neshama sees us being involved in inappropriate viewing, spending time, Hello? things that are worthless and even, even, even wor worse than worthless, what a pity it is and uh, what an embarrassment it is. So that's perhaps the most dangerous aspect of it. Now, now that we spoke about entertainment, the necessity or lack of necessity for entertainment for our children, let's speak about the actual technology and uh, how it affects us and how to deal with it. What if our child demands, give me a phone? What if our child demands, I want to play a video game? I want to watch a movie. I want to have a smartphone. What are we going to answer? Should we give it to them or not? How much should we allow our children to have access to technology and how much we should limit it? So now we live in a different world. In the olden times, it was just television. That was the, the terrible thing. Now television is relatively, relatively harmless. Of course, what we spoke about, it's providing free entertainment, which is taking away the life of a person. It's exposing him to violence, forbidden sexual acts. It's ruining his logic, his ability to think straight. Television is terrible. But the fact that the person is not actively choosing what he wants to watch, as the case is with internet, makes television a little bit less damaging than internet. But 
think about it. You're investing so much in your children. You paying for their clothing, their toys, their tuition, which is so expensive, their college. You want them to grow up to be good people, responsible people, good fathers, mothers, husbands, wives. Hopefully you, you wish they should continue on the path of Torah and be good servants of Hashem. And after investing thousands and thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours, so much effort into your children, if you expose them to internet, television, you are actively ruining them. You're ruining their character. You're ruining their enjoyment of life. As I mentioned at the beginning, the quality of their life, their appreciation for the real world, real relationships is going to be diminished. If I can have free entertainment, why do I need you? Why do I need my spouse? Why do I need children? If I can just plug myself into the, the net and I don't have to be accountable to anyone. I don't have to control my anger. All my desires are going to be fulfilled. A, a parent who invests so much should be careful to protect his investment. And, uh, and the greatest negligence, gross, gross negligence, is when we expose our children to un filtered, uncontrolled media te and technology. So, television is relatively easy to control because television is usually large and it's usually in a, in a, in a living room and uh, everyone can see what the child is watching. So the only thing that remains to be uh, Controlled is the amount of time that the child is spending on it and the programs that he watches. But at least the TV does not have the aspect of secrecy, of privacy, because usually, and that's how it should be, the television should stay in a store. But if you had the mistake to bring the television home, at least keep it in the center of the living room that you should be able to uh, supervise it. And it's important to have television limitations. And the limitations should be attached to proper um, achievement in school and at home and with interpersonal relationships, which means you can allow your child to watch Again, this is uh, only if you are already steeped in it and you cannot get out of it. Ideally, the, the Jewish home should have no TV. But if you are among those unfortunate people who still have television and you don't know how possibly you can get rid of it, at least put limitations on, on, on the, the, the watch, watching time, screen time. A child should only be entertained if he finished his homework, if he helped around the house, if he's a productive member of the family, if he had a, con a, a, a good conversation with the father, with the mother, if he played the game with siblings or with friends outside, and if on top of that he has free time, okay, you can let him watch half an hour, let's say. But if you see he's not doing homework, he's not playing outside, he doesn't have friends, he doesn't interact with parents, no question about it. There should be no television watching because it will only increase this, this wrong behavior. Now, when we go to phones and internet and computers, things become much worse. 
because especially phones are handheld, they can be brought anywhere and in the private of their room, you have no idea and you have no control what's going on. And even computer, if it's a laptop, it can be brought anywhere. So if your child asks for the phone, the first response is no. As long as you can withstand the pressure, it should be no. It, the phone should be the last resort. When you think you're going to die or the child is going to murder you, chas v'shalom, that's when maybe you can start thinking about giving them a phone. Because by giving them a phone, it's really like you are murdering them. So many cases I heard. The parent was worried that the child is going to walk alone on the street from school or to the synagogue or shopping. And therefore, for their protection, they're giving them a phone. Which is a, a, a wrong idea. But let's say you want to give them a phone. So give them the simple flip phone, which has only talk. Not even text, no internet. And there are such things. Even that is the last resort, because then it only grows. And you should know that limitations always go down. You can, you can have more uh, control over your, your oldest child, because nobody has it yet. He's the oldest. As soon as your oldest child will receive a phone, or will receive any other privilege about TV or computer or internet use, the younger child will right away say, he has a why can't I? And they will start pressuring you. And if the old child, you were able to withstand the pressure until they were, let's say, 15 years old, and then you gave in. With the younger child, it's going to be much harder. And you might give in by 13. And with the next child, you might give in by 11. So the older you start, the better it is. The more you can withstand the pressure, the better it is for future children. And keep that in mind. And maybe make specific rules. And say, in our family, the child gets the phone at a certain age. Let's say, I tell my children, when you get married, you'll get a phone. Why do you need a phone now? Or when you're dating, when you're engaged, you want to speak to your fiancé, you're going to get a phone. Who are you going to speak to now? Your friends? Use the house phone. If the house phone is busy, use a mother's phone. Use the father's phone with blocked internet, with a password on your uh, browser and all apps. Only phone. For example, if I let my children use my phone, I first dial the number. And then I lock the phone so that they can only talk. But keep in mind that whatever, whatever leniencies you will introduce, that's it. It's only going to go down from there. So we have to be careful with a, a computer. Let's speak about computer. If you have a choice to get a, a desktop, or laptop, get a desktop and put it in the living room that it should face the room. That the screen should not be hidden. As long as you can, don't give them a phone. Now, if you don't have internet or Wi-Fi home, that's better. If you do, it has to be password protected because it's very cheap nowadays to buy a phone. You can buy a phone for $10, $20, a smartphone. A used smartphone you can buy just for a few dollars. And if they know your password, without you knowing, they're going to bring a smartphone and they will connect to the internet and they will watch everything. Don't think that they're not going to find it. Don't think they don't know. They're going to watch everything. So, now that brings us to what can we do? Let's say I already gave them access to a computer, gave them access to a phone, and let's say they have 
platform. So there is such a thing as monitoring software, or it's called accountability software, which provides a, a partner, it can be a friend, a spouse, or a parent with a, a, a report on what the person is doing on the internet or on the computer. So for example, if you need for some reason to give your child a phone, ideally it should be a simple phone, not smartphone, but let's say you need to give them a smartphone. So ideally it should be a phone with no internet or blocked internet. With the iPhones, it's easy through screen uh, time settings. You can block the internet completely. It will still have certain apps that you approve, but the internet and this app store will be blocked. If not that, the next best is to set up a software that the child will have access to internet, but it will be filtered and it will be monitored, which means the parent will receive a daily or weekly email with all the websites that the child visited. And the point here is not for the parent to spy on the child, but rather the point is for the child to have help. If a child knows that somebody is monitoring him, it's going to be easier for the child to overcome his Yetzir Haram his evil inclination. It's going to be easier for the child to say, you know what? I don't want my parents to know that I did something inappropriate, so I'm not going to do it. And the child will be calm. Yes, I have internet. I can visit websites that are educational. Let's hope they are such websites. I can do a Google search for a project that I need in school. But if I go on YouTube and I type in an inappropriate word, my parents will know about it. If I type an inappropriate word in a Google search, my parents will know about it. And I'm going to be embarrassed. And embarrassment and shame are a very powerful tool to protect anyone from doing wrong thing. Just like if the computer is facing the living room and everybody is watching what's on it, the person using it will not go on to an inappropriate site and will not watch an inappropriate video. So too, without being on top of your child constantly, you create this sense of accountability. I don't want my internet activity to be revealed to everyone. And so I will not go there. It develops their uh, self-control. I know I can go there and I'm not going there because I want to look good in people's eyes. So there are two... Um, websites that I can recommend. They're both using basically the same software. One is called Covenant Eyes. It's a Christian website. And another one is a Jewish website. It's called Guard Your Eyes. G-Y-E, Guard Your Eyes. Covenant Eyes and Guard Your Eyes. Both use the same software. Both have filters and both provide um, monitoring for computers, laptops, and phones. And you can, you can um, set it up in a way that you can view the report daily or weekly. And you can set the sensitivity to um, young child, adolescent, older teen, young adult, according to your um, um, level. And you can also choose websites that they can visit or cannot visit or just use their standard filter. Or if you're brave enough, you can let your child complete freedom, but you are gonna know what's going, what, what websites he visited. 
So if you already are going to allow them to, to have access to internet, please use one of, um, of these or if you find anything else that is as good, you're welcome to use it, but please use it. Don't, don't assume that your child is good, that, they, that you trust them, because this is not about trust. Just like an alcoholic, as good as he may be, as good-hearted as he may be, as responsible as he may be, but when he sees that drink, he cannot control himself. Help the children. And very often they beg. They cannot say it. They're too embarrassed to say it. But they beg and they say, I wish my parents or somebody can just protect me from myself. I wish somebody can be in control. I wish I would be in a controlled environment where it was just black and white. Do this, don't do this. It would be so much easier. I'm struggling and I'm failing. So many teenagers, young adults speak to me about it. And they say, Rabbi, what should I do? I have a problem. I'm addicted to internet. I'm addicted to watching movies. And I've tried to help them, but it's almost impossible. The only thing is outside help which means somebody is actually going to block their internet, limit their ability to be exposed to this. And they will welcome it. At the beginning, they may rebel, but at the end, they will be happier. My boys always tell me, you know, in our school, we have kids who play video games the whole day because they don't have friends. They don't understand that really they don't have friends because they're playing video games. Not they don't have friends, so therefore they play video games. But because they're playing video games, they don't have friends. And my boys tell me, you know, I am so lucky that I have friends. Imagine if I would be like him. I would come home and I would just sit and play video games until nighttime. I would just watch movies and, and watch TV the whole day. It was so boring. I can play with my friends, basketball. I can run around. I can ride my bike. Such nice, enjoyable life I have. And they look down. Thank God they look down on the, on the boys in their class that have TV and they, that, that, that have phones or video games. So the children rebel and Say, no, 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 I want phone, I want internet, I want games, everybody in my class has. But if you're strict with them, in the end, you will be happier. They will be less fearful. They will be less worried. They will be less OCD. They will enjoy life much more, their current life and their adult life. Now, at this point, if you have questions, please ask about technology, about internet, how exactly to apply it to your situation. You can unmute yourself and, and uh, ask, or you can uh, send the question in the chat. Um, <clears throat> I have a question, Rabbi. Yes, please. So, okay, let's say... Um your child is still small, like four or five years old, and uh, you only, let's say you tell the child to do something, they do it, you give them half an hour TV. What do you do the rest of the day when you, as a parent, you have certain things to do and you don't allow your child to watch it because that's, let's say, your maximum, it's half an hour to an hour of TV, and the child's very upset, and then the child says, I'm not going to do anything, says, and just sits in their room and is very unproductive. Yes, uh, unfortunately, the society we live in where the husband and the wife have to work and um, they don't have time for their children, unfortunately, the children are left 
unsupervised and we need to find artificial babysitters which uh, the easy way is to give them the phone to turn the the video give them a electronic game that's the easiest but we all want to have good children and if we know that something is poison for them we're not going to be so quick to give it to them and it's a similar similar struggle when that your child asks for a glass of soda a cup of unhealthy drink or a chocolate bar or a candy bar you might say you know what they're gonna bother me they're gonna whine they're gonna throw a tantrum but if you know that it's really unhealthy it's gonna cause diabetes it's gonna cause obesity it's gonna cause cancer you're not gonna be so quick to give it to them just because you want you want them to leave you alone. It's mostly because parents are unaware of the dangers and they lull themselves into thinking that everything's going to be okay. When they grow up, I'm going to be more strict. The opposite. If you allow your children when they're four or five years old, some start even with a one-year-old or two-year-old, if you allow at such a young age for them to get used to free entertainment, to get used to just being in front of the screen, it's only going to get harder. The research shows that when children are left without electronics, without TV, they become more inventive. They start using their imagination. And there are plenty of games you can buy. For example, I go to the store, I buy a pack of 100 plastic cups for 99 cents i give it to my five six year old boy and i tell him build a tower and i tell him when you build the tower i'm going to take a video how you smash the tower how you kick it and it falls down in slow motion and he sits there and for half an hour he builds this tower and sometimes it falls and he's frustrated but he's inspired by the fact that when it's finished, I'm going to take a video of him. And he builds, 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 becomes higher than he. He builds a whole big, huge construction. Sometimes he uses two packs. And then I tell him, oh, Mazal Tov, you completed. Now I'm turning on my phone and you run and kick the tower. And, he, and or throws the ball and it's so exciting. And then I show it to him in slow motion and he's enjoying it so much and he's learning about construction and he's learning about impact and the physics and everything. So, so time-consuming and educational. Or you can buy them construction set, whether it's Lego or something from metal or whatever it is, Play-Doh, so many options. And it's worth it to spend money on those. That it will make them smarter. It will develop their imagination, their creativity, as opposed to uh, watching TV. Now, let me share with you an amazing statistics. It's not statistics. It's actually uh, research. They analyze brain waves of people when they do different activities, when they're thinking when they're solving math problem, when they're imagining, when they are sleeping, when they're watching TV, and they found out an amazing thing, that a person who is sleeping has higher brain activity than the person who is watching TV. Imagine that. A person who is watching a movie or television show his brain is working less than a person who is sleeping why is that and that's because a person who is sleeping at least he's seeing a dream and he's inventing the dream himself his brain is thinking of the next image the next thought so the brain is active when you're sleeping and seeing a dream but when you're watching a t tv show or a movie, you're being fed the information. 
you are passive. You're just absorbing. You don't even know what's going to happen next moment. Every moment the, the, the scene changes and you're just sitting there like a real potato and absorbing it. Your brain is not... Your, the, 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 the creative, the imaginative part of the brain, the thinking part of the brain is not working. It's only the visual, the absorbing. I'm just absorbing... It's less than sleeping. So do you really want your child to be dumb, stupid, so much that they, they are like less than sleeping their whole life, like really vegetative state, like they're in coma, has shalom? As long as they're watching TV, as long as they're watching the movie, it's as if they, you're putting them in coma. They're not learning anything about real life. They're not learning about how to deal with situations in real life. As, as much as it's going to be educational video, there's going to be very little educational content. And you're only making it harder for yourself. As they grow older, you're going to regret it. As so many parents have. So as easy as it seems, let me just give them the video, let them, me give them the phone, let them play, is going to make it harder because they're going to be less creative. And they're going to require you to play with them and guide them in the future, and you think you're gaining time by giving them the, 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 the movie or the, 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 the game, in reality, you're making your parental job harder because now <clears throat> they can't think for themselves and they, all they're going to want to do for the rest of their life is free entertainment. So change your work schedule, Learn about how to educate the, 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 the children in a, in a less um, time-consuming way. Find out what games you can buy, what activities you can do or for them so that, so that uh, they can do on their own, whether it is coloring, drawing, uh, building, buy for them real tools, nails, a hammer, whatever it takes. And let them work, let them build, let them, let them uh, sometimes they'll break something, but, but they're going to be busy. It's worth it. It's worth the investment. All these games are expensive, but it's worth it because your child is smarter and safer. So as much as possible, try not to use TV and videos as babysitting. As much as possible, it's not good in the long run. It's going to hurt you and it's going to hurt your child in the long run. So two, two, two questions are being asked. One is about shooting games. So shooting games are very dangerous because it, it desensitizes a person. A person who can press a button and shoot somebody will not find it difficult to say a bad word to a friend, to hit a friend, to, to pick up a, a hand on their spouse, on their child. They don't feel the pain of a human being because in the game, you don't feel the pain of the guy you shot. You're just good about it. You're being praised, you're giving points for being cruel, for being murderous. And uh, some games, the more you kill, the more you steal, the more you rob, the more points you get. So what kind of uh, adult do you think your child is going to grow up? Uh, such games should, should not be given at any age. Even for an adult, to shoot someone in a video game, makes him less kind, makes him less sensitive to the pain of others. So, if there are games that you're allowing your children, at least let them be uh, apple picking cars, collecting, uh, collecting coins, even that is worthless, but at least it's not as bad as shooting people. So, try to avoid it. And another question is, <clears throat> that, that is a common question that's being asked, 
what if the my child watches educational videos i don't let them just be entertained or shooting videos for sure not but it's educational so the same research that shows that a person who is watching a tv program a video game <coughs> or a movie his brain activity is less than the person who is sleeping teaches us that computer learning or tv learning or internet learning is not productive if you ask anybody who watched a lecture who listened to a lecture without taking notes just for entertainment and i'm talking about the total lecture <clears throat> how much do they remember right away after the lecture finishes most people will forget up to 90% immediately after lecture you think the educational video will teach them about nature about animals 90% of it will be forgotten the moment they turn off the computer and the rest will be forgotten in the next few days they might have if they watch it again they might remember if somebody mentions they might remember certain details but is it worth to spend so much time and the valuable val opportunity to actually read a book go to a live uh, zoo get a pet is it worth to spend so much time on worthless watching even though it's education let's say let's say it's true although most educational programs will have people who are inappropriately dressed who are behaving inappropriately with with arrogance gava immodesty and let's say even if you find kosher 100% kosher educational video but how much benefit will your child get even if the educational program is about brachas brachot even if it's about torah but but research shows that most of it is forgotten it does not get absorbed because the brain is not working if the brain is not active nothing is remembered so it's all a waste of time waste of your money might as well teach your child um the old fashioned way and i'm sure that the as as the computer learning is increasing in our schools the actual learning will decrease i'm sure of it because whatever research they've done so far shows that it's it's it it it's not as effective as if the child is with a living teacher observing the teacher and uh, taking notes thinking that is why the jewish way of learning is asking questions and um arguing with your teacher with your rabbi with your friend with your chavruta it's not passive it's not a lecture format lecture format is very um unproductive and if it's internet lecture or a movie it's even worse as much as it's nice graphics it's so exciting it's attractive but most of it is going to be forgotten and most of it is not going to be understood if you cannot ask questions if you cannot argue it's going to be forgotten and you know sometimes i even feel bad giving lectures like this because i know most of what i talk about and just like any other lecture will be forgotten unless you take notes or you listen to it again and again and again it's going to be forgotten so don't don't uh, lie to yourself or don't get uh, don't be too gullible to think that educational programs are beneficial now it may if you have to you visit your computer as a baby of course instead of showing them a movie show them educational program but don't think that from that they're going to become smart okay now let me look at another question
Now, uh, let me just read. Uh, I'm not sure who wrote this, but let me read you the, 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 the message. Rabbi, you're so right about entertainment. I promise that what you have covered is only the surface of the problem. Imagine that. I try to, um, to be as graphic as possible, but this is just the surface of the problem. There is so much not known by the general public about the television and entertainment industry. It's more than dangerous. It is truly ungodly. So much science, engineering, and research is applied to these industries at the corporate level. The human mind doesn't stand a chance. We have only to look at past generations and compare it with ours. It is self-evident. It cannot be ignored. The 100 Cops Tower sounds awesome. Okay, thank you very much, whoever wrote this. Um, I appreciate it. Now, um, one more question. Many times when a person is restricted to something, they want more of it. That's true if somebody is telling, speaking about, uh, to them about it. If somebody is telling you, oh, you know, yesterday we saw a movie, it was so amazing, you missed it, your parents don't let you watch, oh, you're, you're so pathetic, oh, we feel so bad for you, then yes. But either if you speak to them and explain to them that, look at these children, your, your classmates who are telling you how much they enjoy is their life really worth living and, 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 and compare it to your life? You have real relationships. You have real friends. You play real games. And all they have is that they're watching someone else living a life. And it's not even real life. Someone else imagining someone else's life. And they are substituting it for your real life. Instead of living your life, you are Im watching someone's imagination. Isn't that pathetic? Um, if, you know, parents are often worried that their children are going to uh, rebel, they're going to leave the house, they're going to be upset, they're going to be hurt, and experience shows that that is not true they very quickly adjust to the rules of the family and they very quickly realize that they are more lucky. If you give in, they will want more. You give them a flip phone, they will want a touch phone. If you give them touch phone, they want smartphone. You give them smartphone without internet, they will want smartphone with internet. The more you give, the more their desire grows. The less you give, at the beginning, they will desire it, but they'll quickly get used to it. I don't need it. I have so many books. I have so many friends. I have so many games. I have real relationship with my parents. I can speak to my parents for hours and hours, and I don't get bored. So that is not a valid concern that they will have desires. Desires only grow when they're fed. The more you feed your desires, the more you grow your desires. As our sages say, who has 100 wants 200. So that's for physical desires. Whatever you have, you want always more. And also our sages say that there is a small organ in the human body. The more you feed it, the more hungry it gets. That's talking about uh, sexual organs. That The more you feed them, the more they want. The less you feed them, the less they want. When a person does not have opportunity to think or experience forbidden things, he does not think about it. He has no desire because he doesn't know about it. Only when he is exposed to it and he is uh, becoming excited constantly about it, you're encouraging that desire to grow and grow, and that's when it makes it hard to control. The more you protect your child, the easier the life of your child will be. And your child will thank you a million times over. When they grow up and they'll see what happened to their friends, 
when they see what could have happened to them and that you protected them, they will thank you because they will owe you, their life to you, their physical life for being born and their spiritual life for being protected from the technology. Now, let me just take one more. Uh, okay, someone recommends a book, Digital Minimalism by Carl Newport. A great read on the topic. Thank you. How do you keep... A boy busy when they don't have other friends of their age to play with, especially during quarantine. So you have to become their friend. <clears throat> and you have to teach them how to use the tools around them. For example, it could be if you have a backyard, you need to buy for them wood and let them build a clubhouse. You have to buy them a toolbox and let them build. Get them a shovel and tell them, dig in the middle of the, my backyard, dig for every foot, I'm going to give you $10. And, uh, or let's say you start with uh, $1. For each foot additional, I'll give you $1 more. For the first foot, I'm going to give you $1. For the second foot, I'm going to give you $10. For the third foot, I'm going to give you whatever. You, you may, and for if you pit, 10 feet deep, I'm going to give you 100, let's say. Let them be busy day and night. Take a tunnel from us to the neighbor across the street. <laughs> you, you have to be inventive. And what if you live in an apartment? So find for them something to build or to work on something in the apartment. For example, now there is such a thing as it's called diamond art, dot art. They give you 10,000 hundred thousand of little uh, colorful diamonds and huge um, beautiful picture and you have to glue one at a time and it takes tens of hours to complete and it's exciting and then you post you you hang it on the wall beautiful art give them a thousand piece puzzle five thousand piece puzzle and give them a reward. If you complete this puzzle, we're going to frame it, we're going to put it on the wall, and I'm going to take you out for pizza. You have to be inventive. Search on the internet. What activities can we give children? I'm sure you're going to find uh, 100 pages worth of material of what to do with your children. Teach them uh, baking, cooking, arts and crafts, so many things. Even we don't even know about it because we think the only entertainment that exists is is tv and uh one more piece of advice is if you live in a neighborhood where your children have no um activity other than internet or their friends so move it's a, it's, a, it's a shocking advice but but what's better to have a child who is bored who is ocd who is uh crazy who is drug addict who is addicted to internet, who has watched everything forbidden under the sun, or instead of in, investing in an in a expensive apartment, an expensive car, and uh, expensive weddings, maybe you should move to a cheaper neighborhood where you will have a backyard, where you will have uh, outdoors nature, and you'll protect your children's neshamot, and and you will have more time on your hands because you don't have to be babysitter. The backyard, the, 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 the fishing, the, the building, the digging, their babies. I, I understand it's, uh, it's a very shocking, but it's, it's, it's worth the investment to move to um, a neighborhood that, that can provide it for your child. Now, one, I even though I said it's going to be the last question, but this question is, is wonderful. I want to read it and address it. Do you think a child who is restricted will not be able to control himself if he is exposed? Like a child who is not allowed any candy at all, then goes to a friend's house and eats tons and tons. Once the child is allowed access to internet, 
maybe in adulthood would he want to indulge. So the premise is very faulty. It's not true at all. Um, a candy and internet are completely two different things. A candy, you know, a candy is something that a child grows out of. If you restrict the child from candy, he will feel that he lacked something in life and he will develop a, an unhealthy desire. But if you allow him to have candy, when he grows up, his desire for sugary things will decrease naturally. And so it's not dangerous to expose him to a little bit candy, controlled amount of, of uh, sugar, because it's more safe. With age, he's going to over, um, he's going to outgrow it. The older he gets, the less his natural desire for candy bar is going to be. The, ch the adults, when, the, when candy is being thrown in the synagogue by, by uh, bar mitzvah, adults don't drop on the floor and crawl and collect the candy. Why? They don't have desire. I don't need candy anymore. It's completely the opposite with the internet. When the child is young, his desire for internet is non-existent. If he is exposed more and more, his desire grows. As he becomes mature, as he becomes um, bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, his hormones start working. And all of a sudden, he has uncontrollable desire to see things that are inappropriate, experience things that are inappropriate. So when we expose our child to internet at a young age, when they don't need it, they don't have the desire yet, and it's more dangerous because they don't have mental capacity to differentiate what's right and what's wrong. So what we're doing is we are uh, inciting, increasing their desire for no reason, and we're exposing them to material that they're not yet capable to process properly. They're going to get scared. They're going to get exposed to forbidden uh, images unnecessarily. <clears throat> As opposed to if we keep them protected and wait until they get married or until they graduate high school, when they're past that dangerous age, from bar mitzvah until about 18, 20 years old, which is the most dangerous time in a person's life, when they don't have brain powerful enough to differentiate good and bad, and when their body is so filled with hormones that they cannot control themselves, once they pass that age, and then we tell them, you know, there is such a tool as internet, there is a phone, this is how you use it, there's these dangers, this, these are the, the, the benefits, then they'll be able to use their mind. Their hormones are now going down. Hopefully, they're going to get married by that time. Their desires have a, an outlet. Now it becomes safe to expose them to internet, to society, to technology. But to expose an innocent child to technology when he doesn't need it, and when he's not ready, his brain is not ready, or to expose an adolescent, a teenager to internet when his hormones, hormones are raging is very risky and very dangerous. So the comparison to candy is not correct. And the reality is that um, the more we expose them to these forbidden images and desires, the more their desires are going to grow. And the more we protect them, the less they know about it, the less they'll want it. And when they're adult, then we'll have a talk with them, then we'll educate them, and they will accept it. They will know how to deal with it. Okay. Um, thank you very much for joining. Um, okay. Thank you for your support. Again, whoever wrote it, I believe the rabbi to be correct. What is abnormal becomes normal. It's better to mature and, no, and learn 
normality and then see the horrors for what they are. Thank you. Um, have a great night. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. Chodesh Tov. All the best.